My name is Dr. Platzmills and I'm an emergency physician. With me is Dr. Fowler from the Department of Ophthalmology. Today we are going to teach you how to use a slit lamp to evaluate common eye complaints. The slit lamp biomicroscope is a tool used by ophthalmologists but is also found in most emergency departments. The slit lamp not only allows for three-dimensional magnification of eye structures but by generating a thin bright beam of light the observer can actually view an optical cross-section of the clear structures of the eye including the cornea, anterior chamber, and lens. Let's learn how to use a slit lamp and diagnose some commonly encountered eye problems. Slit lamp biomicroscopy skills are invaluable in diagnosing problems of the cornea, anterior segment, and sclera of the eye. The slit lamp can also be used to examine the vitreous, the retina, the optic nerve, and also measure the intraocular eye pressure. These are more advanced skills, however, and we will not be covering those in this tutorial. Commonly encountered problems where a slit lamp examination should be performed uh, will include an acute red eye, acute eye pain, and eye and orbital trauma, corneal ulcers, abrasions, foreign bodies, herpetic lesions, and also uh, penetrating globe injuries can be detected by slit lamp examination. The ability to identify hyphema or hypopian, which is red or white blood cells in the anterior chamber of the eye, is also facilitated with a slit lamp examination. While some pathology of the anterior segment can be seen without a slit lamp, a thorough slit lamp examination is useful in defining the extent and depth of injury and may be needed to exclude the presence of a foreign body. In cases where the pathology is not obvious, a slit lamp examination is needed to competently establish or exclude a diagnosis. All slit lamps have three basic components, a light source, a binocular microscope, and an assembly for stabilizing the patient and manipulating the light and microscope. While there are several different models of slit lamps, we will be using a Hogstrite slit lamp for this tutorial. The basic controls are the same for every brand of tabletop slit lamp, but you may need to consult your instruction manual to learn the location of controls on your particular model. To begin, the patient should be properly positioned. Ask the patient to lean forward, placing their chin on the chin rest and their forehead on the bar across the top. Move the chin rest up or down using the dial until the patient's lateral canthus is lined up with the black horizontal mark on the side of the slit lamp. If your slit lamp does not have a mark to indicate the proper positioning of the chin rest, simply raise or lower the chin rest until the light source is able to illuminate the entire eye. Familiarize yourself with the table controls as these differ widely among manufacturers. In this case, the table is moved up or down while depressing this lever. The table should be at a height that allows the patient to be seated comfortably while positioned at the slit lamp. The examiner should adjust their own chair to be seated comfortably as well. Remember the patient should not be seated on a chair with non-locking wheels. To start, make sure the light source is in the neutral or midline position. Find the on-off switch and turn on the light source. Typically on the hog stripe slit lamp, this switch will be located on the underside of the table. This switch also allows the provider to vary the intensity of the beam by varying the voltage. Typically the slit lamp should be operated at 5 volt or 1 half strength so as to prolong the life of the lamp bulb. The joystick is used to move the light source up and down by turning the handle. Moving or rotating the joystick to the right and left causes the light source to move correspondingly. Focus is achieved by moving or rotating the joystick forwards or backwards. The upper control knob is used to adjust the length or height of the light beam. The number gauge next to the upper control knob tells you the length of the beam in millimeters and can be used to estimate the size of a lesion. The lower control knob adjusts the width of the beam. In general, a tall wide beam is used for scanning the eyelids, conjunctiva, and surface of the cornea, while a narrow beam is used for examining the anterior segment structures of the eye. The upper control knob can also be used to add a cobalt blue light filter. This is used to examine a fluorescein stained eye. The examiner needs to adjust the eyepieces of the microscope to accommodate their own intrapupillary distance, or PD, before beginning their exam. In general, the fine focus dials on the ocular should be set at zero. Magnification can be changed from 10x to 16x by moving the lever between the eyepieces. You should start your exam at the 10x magnification level and increase to 16x to better visualize subtle findings. 
For most examinations, you will want to keep the microscope arm in the midline position and rotate the light source to maximally illuminate the eye. However, there are times when you may need to set the microscope arm at an angle to better view certain pathology or to make it easier to access the eye during foreign body removal. Once you and your patient are comfortably and properly positioned at the slit lamp and the overhead lights are dimmed, you are ready to begin. Start by examining the eyelids and lashes using a tall, broad beam of light under low magnification with the light arm and microscope arm in midline position. Next, using the same settings, evaluate the surface of the conjunctiva, cornea, and sclera. Remember, small adjustments in focus and lateral movement are made by moving or rotating the joystick. In patients with traumatic eye injuries, be sure to examine the entire sclera, conjunctiva, eyelid margins, and canalicular system for signs of lacerations. If a corneal abrasion or hepatic lesion is suspected, you should perform a fluorescein examination using the cobalt blue filter. You will need a fluorescein strip, topical anesthetic, and gloves. To apply fluorescein, place a drop of topical anesthetic on the fluorescein paper strip, then touch this wet paper to the posterior surface of the lower eyelid. Make sure you use a fresh unexpired bottle of anesthetic for each patient. If the patient is having severe pain, a drop of topical anesthetic should be instilled in the lower fornix prior to fluorescein installation. Of note, if pain is completely relieved with the topical anesthetic, a problem with the cornea is likely. After applying fluorescein, turn the upper knob until the cobalt blue light is on. Corneal epithelial defects will stain green with fluorescein when viewed with the blue filter. If you see fluorescein uptake on the surface of the cornea, ask the patient to blink to make sure this is truly a lesion and not just a mucus strand or chance collection of dye, known as pooling of dye. Once the surface of the eye has been examined, you are ready to perform the slit beam evaluation. Using a lower knob, decrease the width of the light source to create a thin beam and move the light source to an approximately 45 degree angle. By generating a very thin beam of light directed at an angle, you're able to view an optical cross section of the clear structures of the eye. The first structure the light passes through is the cornea, which under normal conditions is clear. The first curve is the precorneal tear film and corneal epithelium. The broad part of the beam is a cross section of the corneal stroma, and the posterior curve is the corneal endothelium. Next, light passes through the optically empty anterior chamber, which is filled with clear aqueous fluid. If light is scattered or visible in this region, this usually represents the presence of cells and or proteinaceous material. The light beam is then reflected off of the surface of the iris. To clearly focus the details of the iris, you may need to gently push the joystick forward. The light beam then passes through the lens of the eye. The lens has a lamellar or layered structure, and if a patient's pupil is naturally large or dilated, you can see all of these layers. The beam passes through the lens in this order. Anterior lens capsule, anterior lamellae, lens nucleus, posterior lamellae, and posterior lens capsule. Notice, when focused on the posterior parts of the lens, the cornea is out of focus. When a patient has cataracts, which is defined as any opacification of the lens, you will be able to see that. This is an example of a very dense, mature cataract. This is a corneal abrasion. The defect stains green with fluorescein as viewed with the cobalt blue filter. Be sure to avert the upper eyelid to exclude the presence of a foreign body. Corneal abrasions are painful. Apply anesthetic to the surface of the cornea before applying the fluorescein dye. Complete relief of symptoms with topical anesthetic. Support the diagnosis. This is a corneal ulcer. Fluorescein will stain any associated epithelial defect. A whitish outer ring or focal white spot is known as an infiltrate which represents reactive white blood cells. Using the slit beam, you can estimate the depth of ulceration or thinning of the cornea. Notice how the slit beam is thinner between the two arrows. You can also estimate the depth of infiltration with the slit beam. This infiltrate involves only the superficial layers of the cornea. This infiltrate, seen here with a broad beam of light, is involving the full thickness of the cornea as seen with a very thin slit beam. This is a hypopion, which is a collection of white blood cells in the anterior chamber. In this case, there is a layered hypopion that is easily seen at the bottom of the anterior chamber of the eye. A hypopion may be a reaction to a corneal ulcer 
or may be caused by an infection in inside the eye turned endophthalmitis. A hypopion resulting from endophthalmitis as may occur after a delay in treatment of an open globe injury or after recent cataract surgery represents a true eye emergency. A hypopion can also be microscopic. In this case, white blood cells freely float in the anterior chamber along with protonaceous material. This combined finding, known as cell and flare, is seen with iritis but can be difficult to detect. Keep your slit beam at an angle, shorten the beam to one millimeter and narrow it to approximately one millimeter and turn up the lamp voltage. Focus on the anterior space. This finding should look something like the light beam of a movie projector shining in a dusty room. This is a dendritic ulcer in a patient with herpes keratitis. The detection of this finding is aided by the use of fluorescein staining. Often, patients will not present with the severe pain found with corneal abrasions, despite the sometimes large area of fluorescein uptake. If a patient presents with irritation or foreign body sensation, but has extensive stain uptake, suspect a herpes infection. This patient has iritis. Note the perilimbal injection of the conjunctiva, the mid-dilated pupil, and the cell and flare in the anterior chamber. These patients tend to have photophobia or light sensitivity. Traumatic iritis is common after a blunt injury to the eye. This is a hyphema caused by red blood cells in the anterior chamber. Traumatic injuries to the eye often produce hyphemas and are typically seen as a layering of blood cells in the anterior chamber. These blood cells can block the outflow of aqueous humor, leading to increased intraocular pressure. Patients with large hyphemas must be closely monitored for this development. If a diffuse subconjunctival hemorrhage is present in addition to the hyphema, suspect a ruptured globe and proceed appropriately. This is a subconjunctival hemorrhage, which represents blood layering beneath the conjunctiva. Note how the redness is solid, unlike the redness seen with conjunctivitis. Subconjunctival hemorrhages usually resolve without problems or intervention. This patient has an open globe injury. In this case, iris protrudes through the laceration of the cornea. A loss of the roundness of the globe, a defect in the pupil, or streaming of fluorescein from the base of the foreign body are all signs of an open globe injury, which is a surgical emergency. This patient has a foreign body embedded in the cornea. Foreign bodies that do not enter the anterior chamber may be removed with a needle or metal or plastic spatula. After the form body is removed, a corneal burr may be used to remove any associated rustering. Now that we've learned how to use the slit lamp, let's do an exam. Come in. Hi, my name is Dr. Platts Mills. My name is Isabel the Clown. Isabel, what's bothering you? Yep, me and the other clowns were getting out of the clown car and I accidentally got kicked in my left eye and now all I can see is clowns and tiny elephants. It hurts. I see. Well, let's take a close look and see if you've injured your eye. Isabel, let's take a look. Hmm. Hmm, ah. Uh. One of the most commonly encountered problems with the slit lamp is not being able to turn on the light. This leaves the patient in the dark and leaves you feeling like a clown. First, make sure the slit lamp is plugged into the wall. Thanks. Then, make sure the plugs along the arm of the slit lamp are connected. If the slit lamp console has an on-off switch, that needs to be turned on. And then the switch here for the slit lamp needs to be turned on. The dial for the slit lamp brightness should be turned to half strength or 5 volts. And the upper control knob should be switched from the cobalt blue setting to the white light. Finally, if you're still unable to get a light source, you need to check the light bulb, which is housed in the upper chamber. Well, is there anything else to check? Another common problem is difficulty focusing on the patient's eye. Remember, with the Hogstrite slit lamp, you focus by moving the entire slit lamp towards or away from the eye. The light needs to shine on the patient's eye. Check to be sure that the patient's forehead is against the forehead strap. Then move the light source and microscope all the way to the back of the table. As you move forward, the eye should come into view. 
If the slit lamp is locked, you will have to loosen the screw on the right side of the table to move it. When you are finished, lock the apparatus to prevent damage to the microscope. We hope this tutorial has been helpful. With these skills, you will be able to perform a slit lamp examination with confidence. Slit lamp examination is an important component of the evaluation of acute eye pathology, and knowledge of this tool will allow you as an emergency care provider to deliver the best care for your patient.